Hello, my name is Christopher Ozuna, and I'm a PhD candidate at UC Santa Barbara, although I'm currently a visiting PhD student at the Danish School of Education in Aarhus, Denmark. I want to thank you, Dr. Karin Derek peterson for taking the time to talk with me about your perspectives on and your predictions about teacher education and what countries can learn from each other when it comes to their education systems. I'm excited to hear your thoughts, so let's start. Can you tell me what's unique about education and the education system in Denmark? Probably compared to other countries, maybe one of the most unique things in Denmark is that education is free. So students don't have to pay to go to teacher education or to go to the university or wherever, because uh, even school or high schools, uh, everything is free in Denmark. And uh, I guess that that's a, a big difference compared to many other other countries and we're quite proud of that because we find that this is a, a good thing. Um, it, uh, so that would be the first thing. Another thing that I would say about education in Denmark is that we are concerned about democracy. We like to have our citizens being dem democratic citizens. <clears throat> being able to participate, participate in dialogues uh, between students and teachers, between students themselves, to have to hear the students' voices and to, to have students to have an influence on their life as students. So, so the de democracy in practice, but also in the way we're organizing the educations where students are included in various organizations and forms and being heard is also, I think, uh, uh, unique, or at least for the Scandinavian countries, it's normal for us to have that. Um, How long do you think that has been a, an important value in Danish schools and Scandinavian schools? Is that a recent development or is that something that's been a part of the system for a long time? I think it has been a part of the system for a long time. In particular, uh, if I should say it, it is in particularly after World War II, okay. there has been a, a, a great focus about uh, educating democratic citizens because it had such a big impact what we saw during World War II and the uh, this whole political thing where education was actually used to build specific persons in, in that time, Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. So after the World War, all over in Europe and in Germany also today, there's been a big, big focus on we want to have democratic citizens. We will never see that happen again. And education, the educational system is a very important thing to help democracy. Actually, it's the sort of John Dewey for many years ago, but kind of it was reactualized and it has been the focus in, in, in Denmark and in Scandinavia since, since then. So actually it's a long history. Mm -hmm. As the, um, you mentioned it at first about how the Danish education system is almost entirely free for participants. Has that also been in place since post-World War II, or is that a more recent development? No, that has also been in place. It has never been, we've never seen paid education, actually. There are educations where you can't, where you pay, for example, business educations, but most of them would be master's educations that you will have and pay on top of, for example, our master thesis or master, but but it has been like that for really many years in Denmark. And what I think, uh, there was a period in the 1960s, 70s, uh, where the focus, it was uh, uh, influence from, you know, the student, uh, student uh, things in Paris and all over Europe, so that there was a focus on because I guess before the 1960s we had mostly uh, people not a lot of women first of all at the universities uh, and secondly those who were uh, attending universities were from upper class 
But from the 60s, kind of the educational system went on to be a much more uh, a system for the middle class and still the higher class, but for all, emphasizing all women had to have to go to the university, minorities, whatever, uh, so, and it should be free. So, so it is, so it's a very strong, strong position in the Danish system that we, we think about education as free. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, how did you begin your career in, in education and especially in teacher education? Yeah, in education, I have a personal story and I have a professional story. Okay. The personal story is actually that my father was a teacher my grandfather was a teacher. My grandmother had a teacher education, one of the first in for women. There were special women teacher education places in the 1920s and 30s and so on. So there were not a lot, but she had. So both my, my grandfather, my grandmother and the second grandmother, all, all of them. And uh, when I was a child, my parents had a, a big, kind of network of teachers who are discussing teacher education all the time or philosophy or anything. So that's kind of the personal thing. So, and I've been teaching as a teacher uh, in, in school as well. But my professional life kind of an interest in teacher education comes because I am in teacher education and I'm a teacher educator. However, I started a little bit from the side because I started uh, teaching uh, migrants Danish as a second language. So uh, that is my, that was my professional life or whatever. And from there, I went into the university where I started teaching the teachers who teach uh, adult migrants in Danish as a second language. So I was a teacher trainer. And then I passed over to the Aarhus University, where we have this Danish School of Education, and I started research and I'm also in an international society for teacher education. So I've been kind of developing my interests along this for many years. So also in the research part of my, my life. How did you start mm -hmm. working with, um, with migrants learning Danish as a second language? Well, I guess it was actually because my subject from the university, I, I myself uh, studied at the university in Aarhus and I had Russian language as my first subject. And then I had a lot of other languages, Bulgarian, Greek, Czech, and so on, German languages. So I've been interested in languages for a long time. And I also myself tried to learn a totally different language, what Russian language really is. So when it came to, to possibilities for work, there was a kind of, there was this little area of teaching migrants Danish as a second language, which I found really interesting. It was a developing kind of little area. And I started being very interested in, in it and started teaching. And also by, at the same time, uh, uh, researching this area, we kind of developed the research profile of this. It wasn't as usual in Denmark as it is now. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Um, what kind of work were those students doing? Like what was bringing them to Denmark in the first place? Oh, um, most of them were refugees, okay. actually. So there were, there been refugees since the 1970s, actually, in uh, in Denmark. There were also migrants in the beginning from Turkey, from Morocco and Pakistan, but later on from all, all over the world, actually, uh, there came uh, refugees and migrants to Denmark since, yeah, since the 1970s, actually. So there was this, uh, an awareness that well, people from Turkey wouldn't speak Danish, maybe wouldn't speak English, wouldn't speak German. So there was an interest in having people to learn the language. Because also there was in the beginning, probably people thought that, that the migrants would return to their homelands, to their, their countries, but they didn't. Okay. 
So be, mm -hmm. before that time in the 1970s, was there a lot of or any immigration to Denmark? At very, all? very little, very, very little. There was maybe you've heard about the um, Hungarian uh, revolution 1956. It was a communist, a communist system. You may know that. And there was a kind of a revolution there. And there, there are a lot of people from Hungary kind of flew out of the communist countries, but, but very little compared to Vietnamese also as part of the, the war there in the, the 60s came also to, to Europe and Denmark, but it's only seen since the 1970s that we in Denmark and all the other parts of Europe have seen an increasing migration. Mm -hmm. What are some of the current issues in education that are happening in Denmark right now? Um, well, as I see it, some of the current issues are that we are very much um, kind of connected to, for example, international assessment systems, as for example, PISA. Mm -hmm. PISA plays an important role in the way the Danish schools work, the Danish educational system is set up. So I get, I think that the internationalization through assessment PISA, we have these TIMS, the mass yeah. assessments and so on, have, have played an, a very important role. We even talk about the PISA shop in, uh, in Denmark, which was in the, 1990s and and Syria because suddenly people realized that the Danish children were maybe not as good in reading as they supposed and so on. So that has, so I would say that and and then what we have seen all over uh, the world, the standardization of curriculum, maybe what we could say new public uh, new public management neoliberalism in education has also uh, had a great impact in Denmark focus on test and testing assessment uh, where before maybe we had this uh, we had to develop democratic citizens well now it's much more on have we are the children fit for the global competition and all these kind of things? So in this way, um, yeah, in this way there has been uh, some issues. Yes, and I forgot to say also the building aspect, uh, which was very unique to the Danish uh, system, that we have had this focus on the building, on the whole person approach and so on, which a lot of people still have today, but are fighting a little bit with those more international issues. That could, that, is, that are some of the issues. But we have other issues, yeah, other issues as well, maybe also uh, connected to this uh, idea, value about um, uh, equality, because we see in particularly that boys from migrant families, in a way, kind of don't get, uh, some, many do, but there still is a lack of migrant, in particularly boys, uh, to, to be, to get an education in Denmark, which is a big issue for people. Like, why is it so? And what can we do to, to develop this? Hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about how the reaction to, for example, PISA and these other standardized tests has sort of changed over time? Like, because there, there must have been some sort of agreement about joining at the beginning, right? But I, I've, in the time I've been here in Denmark, I hear a lot of people bring this up, and it seems like the, you know, opinion is sort of changing. So how did that yeah. sort of occur over time? I think that... In a way, it was in the beginning, people were very positive also in seeing that, well, that's interesting and that's a good idea to have these assessments and to see, well, how well are we doing? And it's um, it's good to know also uh, in at an international level. So, but only, of course, if we can decide ourselves how education should be. 
So I think that the, the point has been that uh, it has changed. So politicians have wanted to make, to kind of change education and the education system in order, well, for the students to be better at PISA. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess that this could be what is, uh, what has uh, caused opposition to it, uh, which has changed the, 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 the thinking about it. Because what we have seen since, for example, 2013, where we had this new um, um, uh, school reform, and in this school reform, all the tests and all the assessments were implemented. And in Denmark, we've, we have had this idea that small children should not be at, uh, assessed. Mm -hmm. But with the 213 uh, reform, they started assessing and national tests at very low grades. So we were used to having, of course, exams and grades in grade seven, grade eight, but not in grade four and so on. So we, we, we saw pressure on the children also and on the teachers to to adjust to this way, which probably was not the idea from the OECD in the beginning, but it's what the educational politicians in the local countries have have uh, implemented. Yeah, and I'm assuming that these tests. Well, I know PISA does, but I, the as for the Danish national tests. Are they focusing mainly on these kind of core subject areas like Danish language and yeah. mathematics? Yeah, math, math, yeah. And so these, so for the idea of like Bildung and these other things that schools have been traditionally responsible for, right? Like if they're not mm. being measured, does it, does it? Yeah, mm. yes. And things? then it, when it was not math shirt, for example, music, which had mm -hmm. a big, kind of position also or, or gym or whatever. So people would in, would kind of collect their focus, their, their teaching on the, to prepare the children to, to take the tests. Uh, so, but, but there was of course, and I think two years ago because the, the criticism has been strong since. So there was an agreement that well, which is a little bit absurd in a way, but in as a way to get these music and drama and more creative subjects, give them a little bit bigger status, they implemented assessments, uh, exams, okay. <laughs> which is, yeah. <laughs> Has, have those started yet? Yeah, it started. Yeah, I don't actually. I must say, I don't know how it how it works, but uh, <laughs> yes. So so that's a little yeah which is a change, of course, in, in the thinking of what are the values of the values of education. So, so this is a very big issue in the discussions, the values, what is it that education should do and what is it that we want with our, our citizens and, it, and the education in school. Mm -hmm. I, okay. This is just referring to me, but um, in the United States, like we talk a lot about how this issue like well what is the purpose of schooling but then also you know that students should be graduating high school so that they can be college career or community ready is there in Denmark like a have the universities and higher education institutions been saying that Danish students are not ready for the university when they arrive like is there that kind of pressure coming from above back down no, I don't think that we have that uh, that big discussion on that because, well, when they when the students leave, but maybe it's also because when the students want to go into the university, that there, there is a process of um, uh, they just they just can't they cannot just come into the university. They have to go, and they have to have certain subjects from the high school if they want to, for example, study uh, uh, physics or math or psychology or medicine. So they have to have quite high uh, scores 
from the high school. But as when they have these scores, they are on. No, I haven't seen those those discussions in Denmark. That's interesting because I, I mm. we, we talk a lot about that as sort of um, I don't know if justification is the right word, but just as part of the reason why like there needs to be this sort of increased rigor and focus on standards and assessments of those standards because when students are getting to the universities, you know, or the universities are saying, well, they're not ready for college level English or college level math or whatever the case may be. But but of course it is it is built in that the students need to have, they must have a certain, um, well, we have this system from zero to 12, to 12, maybe you know our grading system. Yeah. So for example, if you want to be, go, get into psychology at the University of Aarhus, you have to have kind of top gradings from, from high school. Okay. But it's, it's not that, um, but there are other ways also. So if the students cannot have the grades they can have, they, there is a possibility to, to take actually the subject once more at another, at another educational system during the summertime, okay. for example, in order to heighten their grades. So, so there are, you know, alternative ways for the students to get into the university. And uh, okay. so, no, no, I don't think that we have that issue, have that issue a lot. Not at the university, ah. but, but maybe, maybe at um, voc in vocational education, actually. Okay. But in a way, it was a different thing because I think some years ago we had there was a level of um, admission. Is it called admission? The great admission uh, that for the vocational schools was was kind of heightened from well, two to four, which meant that in particularly, actually, again, boys, um, Danish as well as migrant boys who weren't that good or just a little bit lazy or whatever, didn't do a lot in school, uh, they had problems coming into these voc vocational educations because, for example, in the subject Danish, they wouldn't have this for which wow. was needed. So actually the opposite thing has been discussed. Shouldn't we take this away again and say, well, we, should, we shouldn't have this admission because we lose a lot of uh, people in the educational system if we have too high, too high uh, grades for the, for the for kids. Yeah, so maybe the, it's the opposite, at least in, in the vocational education where we need students in Denmark. Mm -hmm. Where do you see teacher education in Denmark in the next five to 10 years? What do you see changing? I think there would be, and maybe also should be, a bigger fo uh, focus on content knowledge for okay. students in teacher education. Because as it is now, I see there is a big focus on didactic skills, okay. teachers being good, uh, Di uh, well, uh, being good in didactics and being good in caring about the children, mm -hmm. but not in particularly high focus on from the student teacher students side to be to on on content knowledge, and and uh, what I think and I know that this is also what the teacher educations. Uh, university colleges really focus on is to to focus on the content knowledge, the combination of the content knowledge with didactic knowledge, with whole person approach, uh, so that the, it's well, yeah, and to attract maybe what I know that uh, university colleges in Denmark would really like to attract, well. Uh, students with high grades from high schools, mm -hmm. so so good students. So they also see they also want to kind of have how can we intensify, what can we do for the students in teacher education to intensify their 
work on subject knowledge as work on this education. Okay. And I guess mm -hmm. I should say, and I only know this from talking to other people here in Denmark. So the, the way that it mainly works, right, is for a student in teacher education, they pick uh, kind of varies, but two or three subject areas, right, that they're focusing on that they'll be licensed to teach. Um, and so normally, right, like they have to pick one of these sort of core subjects, if I remember correctly, Danish or- mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, math. Um, and like, then they might mm -hmm. pick a couple other, um, I'm not sure what they're called, but like, you know, other secondary areas. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're saying that you suggest that there should be more focus on the content knowledge in the way that the students are, or in the areas the students are focusing on. Yeah, throughout that, that teacher, yeah, throughout the teacher education, yeah. Okay. So that's one focus. Another focus is the placement of students and the, the possibilities, the connections between teacher education and schools and how could this, the, the, how could, could there be more kind of uh, collaboration between university colleges and schools in order to see uh, st student teachers, but also new teachers kind of uh, stay in the teacher profession and not leave it. So that's also an issue that that uh, is, uh, I would, I think would be of importance for teacher education. And a certain, a third maybe, so that would be, so the more content knowledge, the placement. Mm -hmm. And what we see in Denmark is also that in some areas of the country, there's a lack of teachers and in other areas there is no lack of teachers so the idea that our government just now has uh, suggested is that that they want to have the teacher education spread out geographically not only in the biggest cities but also in other areas of the uh, of the country in order for people to be able to uh, in a, a decentralization in a way to have teacher yeah. education at various points. And that's sort of uh, almost a reverse, right, of what they had been doing, because then there used to be a lot of smaller teacher ed programs that were collapsed into these bigger university yes. colleges. Yes, and so now that's they it. Want to yeah, now, yeah, you're right. Now they want to do the, 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 the opposite in a way, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Which parts of Denmark are having um, shortages of teachers? In particularly to the so southern part of Zealand, where Copenhagen okay. is, and there are these small islands out there. So actually in Zealand, which you wouldn't have expected because that's where Copenhagen is. Right. Yeah. But maybe the students uh, attending teacher education in Copenhagen are not so... Uh, interested in going out to okay. smaller okay. cities on that island while in Jutland actually there already are quite a few uh, teacher education kind of departments and here we don't see this uh, lack as much which is is okay. quite interesting in a way mm -hmm. right. does the pay mm -hmm. vary greatly the teacher pay does that change a lot <laughs> Um, I, I don't, I actually, I think that the, the teacher, um, wages in Denmark, the pay is, is good. And particularly if you've been a teacher for many years, because, uh, the teachers have quite a strong, uh, union and, uh, the union has fought for good wages. So I think that, uh, teachers actually in Denmark ha have a quite good payment okay so it is it has, the recruiting it has to the been rural this... areas that's more of the, mm -hmm. the issue oh yeah yeah the... yeah. Okay. yeah that's a, i think that's much more the rural areas it's it hasn't anything to do with the payment it has something to do with well how many possibilities do they see for themselves and their families in that area okay more than more than more than the payment actually okay mm-hmm
What do you think needs to happen in teacher education in Denmark? We sort of talked about this a little bit, but is there anything yeah, else we you took, want to yeah. expand on? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think this about the content knowledge, I find uh, important, um, the professionalism in, in the content knowledge and the didactics, but of course also what uh, pointed to, teachers have a really broad uh, connection to many, many various, should we say, groups. Because in Denmark, for example, the work with parents play a crucial role, role if you are a teacher. So uh, teachers must be able to work with parents, with organizations, will we have this open school uh, uh, system where they might even work with companies, with organizations, with sports clubs, with churches, with so so actually the the social skills of teachers should be in place. So they're they're a great um, what should we say um, that there are big requirements and demands on teachers today. Yeah, and even the parents can can phone the teacher, say, well, what is this for my child? So there is this direct link between teachers and parents. They have this half half yearly uh, consultations with the with the children and the parents. So actually, it's quite a yeah, it's a widespread competence. To, yeah, yeah exactly. lots of, a lot things of things to, to take care of. In just yeah. four years of teacher ed, right? So yeah, it's um, really. What, what do you think are some things that need to happen in teacher education more globally, whether that's specifically in Europe or, or, or even beyond? Well, I would like to see that we could step a little bit off and away from this standardization and um, dominance maybe of, uh, yeah, tests yeah. and uh, uh, assessments and the same kind of standards all over in all countries so to return a little bit more to see what is it that uh, also the whole person again i think mm -hmm. we should see look much more on the whole whole person approach well i find for example dewey well he developed a lot of very very good principles that still could be implemented really all over the world at a local basis yeah. to see what we, what is important for the children to learn really to have the focus not on the assessment but to have the focus on what is it that children should need and should be able to do in this very complex society that they grow up into right and children must also learn to take decisions to decide to influence, to be democratic, to discuss, to handle conflicts, to know a lot, to handle climate change, all these things. Uh, so, um, well, to, to, let, to, to let the people, the children be more in the focus rather than the assessments and the tests and so on. This would be what I would, could see as a, as a way. Do you, mm -hmm. um, I know you've been involved in some of that work with this sort of futures of education kind of, um, I'm not sure what you would call it, like a yeah, yeah. education project or, or um, like way mm -hmm. of thinking. Do you, do you yeah. see that as a, as a something that might have the potential to get more um, influence in? I think yes, I think it would, and and you are mentioning it now. We see on the international scale, we maybe could say that we see a difference between the UNESCO approach and the OECD approach, right. where the UNESCO approach is much more based on values and on equality, on um, on. A democracy and so on, whereas OECD is much more on assessment and on tests and so on. So 
what I think at least I see a movement in Denmark and also in other countries is that that the UNESCO approach seems to be attractive to many people and and to 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 educators in Denmark but also in other countries. Yeah. Uh, so yes, that that might be my answer to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't heard of that before coming here and it definitely grabbed my attention for all of those reasons that you just that you just mm -hmm. outlined. It seems almost mm -hmm. in some ways a response to this the past 20, 30 years of of heavy standardized assessments and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, mm. So it'll be interesting to see what, what happens with it and where it goes. Mm. Um, and of course we have seen in Europe this very, very big uh, movement among school children. You know that the Swedish girl Greta Thunberg, she was yeah. a school child starting all these climate uh, demonstrations all over the world. Now we've been influenced by Corona, but of course it has uh, made, it, it is a big impact on politicians and all educators also. Well, we, we, we also have to address this and we also have to see the values about what is important for education also to take care of nature, to take care of. So this uh, taking care of the ethics, the, the quality, um, yeah such kind of things I guess so that that is a way of a kind of a maybe a change in, yeah. in understanding mm. well my last question for you then is what do you wish you would have known prior to uh, becoming a teacher educator or as you were learning to be one I'm quite happy about what <laughs> my own kind of development uh, maybe what i'd like uh, students today to know in a way is that that we are also part of this organization and of this global policy approaches and sometimes uh, teachers in a single school don't see that oh. and maybe it would help to also know the very big picture of where is it why is it that we are doing like we are doing just now it's a kind of a historical development from one point to this point so maybe this much more historical kind of awareness of the global local but also yeah. uh, situation that actually we as individuals are kind of working inside, maybe that might help student, uh, student teachers and everybody a little bit to understand why they feel stressed or why it's so difficult and why do we have all these tests and so on. And why do we have this and why is this like that? So maybe this historical awareness could help people also um, have a, a an approach to it that is also to say that, well, we can also change something. Yeah. It may be difficult, but we can. We can also, uh, we, we do have uh, possibilities to discuss and to say, well, maybe we should do it in another way than this way. Yeah, that's a good point. You're right. Like when you're in a school yourself, you kind of lose the forest for the trees. So that's something that, yeah, people in positions like like ours and teacher education can can call focus to right to help see as that we're part of this bigger system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to say thank you very much, Karen, for personally for all the mentorship you've given me um, in the time that I've been in here in Denmark. And on behalf mm -hmm. of C. Taren, just thank you so much for your time today. We really okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Good. <laughs>